Hey everyone, welcome to what you may have missed in Hell of a Boss episode one, Murder Family. That episode was a die for. Really, Fox? What? They made a killing with that episode. Stop, just stop, please. Back to why we are here. We have several on this list that even caught us by surprise. Really? Would have thought we'd expect this kind of stuff after the pilot. Anyway, the first thing we found was actually pretty cute. The name of the school is Puppies Junior School. I bet Charlie would love that. For number two, we noticed something about our favorite Murdo's teacher, Mrs. Mayberry. She's actually ambidextrous. <laughs> All right. Number three, well, there is something that Blitz. It's Blitz! The O is silent! Okay, jeez. Blitz. Happy now? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. We'll enjoy. There's a small horse statue next to Mrs. Mayberry's husband's computer. Could this be a non judgmental horse? Number four. Mrs. Mayberry must be either really passionate about her class or math because her classroom curtains even have math symbols on them. Well, we do know that she is passionate about other things. Number five. There are several cars in the school parking lot, including Mrs. Mayberry's, which says, I heart school, and a blue car that has a shorthand for pee before you go on it. Must be apparent. The most notable one is the pink car that has the license plate number Pen15. I don't know about you, but I do not want to meet the faculty or staff member with that license plate. Number six. No wonder Mrs. Mayberry peels out of the parking lot so quickly. There's a speed limit sign saying children's zone 90 kilometers. That's almost 60 miles per hour. Okay. Well, anyone else notice the huge bones under the school? Well, she did have a big bone to pick with a certain cheating husband, if you know what I mean. Ugh, Fox. Number eight. On the wall behind Blitzo's desk lamp. It's... Blitz! The O is silent! How many times do I have to tell you people? As I was saying, on the wall behind Blitzo's desk lamp, we see two tickets saying circus ticket. Maybe this is a hint to Blitzo's past. Or a clue about the next episode. Number nine. Maybe Blitz. Finally! Thank you! <laughs> really likes lemons. Or maybe Moxie thought it would make a funny joke about his sour personality. Either way, Blitz has an entire lemon tree in the corner of his office near the dartboard. Number 10. As we can tell by the couple's wallpaper, they're kind of bad at... No, wait. Is that a pelvis? Huh. Number 11. So, I guess Blitz has had a lot happen in his office? I can understand a few of his buzzers, but just wow. He has seven buzzers. More coffee. Soiled my pants. Horny client. Deranged client. Client giving birth. Ghost. And of course, Stolas. I don't think I want to know what caused a few of those to have been added. I do. Anyway, number 12. One of the drawings on the wall with an arrow through it is a RoboFizz. I wonder who shot that arrow and if the picture was drawn strictly for target practice. And wait a minute, is that... is that Serpentious? Oh, would you look at that! Everyone else thinks he's a fucking loser too! <laughs> hey, stick to your own fucking series! Number 13. Next to the eel tank, there's a picture with a face torn. The imp looks like a female imp with male horns in the position of the Mona Lisa. Number 14. The fire truck for the fire imps is number 420. This is the police code for weed. <laughs> I wonder if the M's have lit it up. Seems they may have sparked something themselves with that blaze it on the other side. Ah, shit! You two are fucking narcs, aren't you? What? No. <laughs> you could have fooled me. That line totally had a cop trying to use hip lingo vibe. Moving on with number 15, we have... <sighs> Blitz. What's up with the sign? What? It's a perfectly professional... Oh, uh, what the fuck? God damn it, I told Moxie I should have just sent a normal text, but no! Texting and driving is bad, sir. You can kill someone. Like, that isn't our fucking business! Whoa, calm down. This stuff probably happens all the time. You're still getting business, right? Yeah, I guess. Besides, before you go into the living room, we have number 16. A billboard that poses a question we all want to answer. 
did. Not for me, thanks. I'm good. Already had your visit with Stolas, huh? Oh, fuck off! Oh, you'd like me to. Boys, please. You can fight later. You got a list to finish. Number 17. Once we get to the home of this loving family, we can spawn an interesting trophy. A child's head mounted on the wall. The fuck? Is that a mirror frame out of the bones? You think that's bad? Just wait till you see our hidden treasure, number 18. A lamp consisting of a stand made of bones in a skin-bound lampshade. Also, is that an urn in a wheelchair? Call me crazy, but I think they just weren't ready to say bye to Mima yet. Wait, do they seriously have bones mixed in with the firewood? Oh yeah, and hey, check out the arm in the fridge. Gotta keep those leftovers on hand. Box? What? You know how hard it is to come across quality meat these days? It'll cost you an arm and a leg. God, can we just get to the next bit here? Oh, Blitz has black blood. I wonder if that's an imp thing. Maybe it's all Hellborns, but no time to dwell on that. Let's get back to the house. Why? What? You don't want us to talk about the room where the furniture, trophies, tapestries, food, and framed pieces are all made of stretched, rotten, putrid flesh? Can we please get away from this home and go somewhere nicer? What about Stolas's place? Look at his bathroom! I'd kill for a bubble bath with such a candles like that. Seriously, I'm kinda jealous, but also check out the constellations. All along his curtains you can see many different constellations that are normally seen in the Northern Hemisphere. And with him being tuned to the stars, it makes sense he'd have various astrology signs surrounding his tub. Kinda weird that the constellations change directions though. Then they just change right back. That is weird. I'll tell you what's not weird. Blitz's phone. Why am I not surprised Blitz is an imp emoji and a shorthand for go fuck yourself on his case? But yellow, really? Yeah, it's for people who piss me off when I'm working! Blitz, that joke was not your best. Yeah, but not my worst either. Don't know if I'm more scared by that or by these weird stick ornaments. What are they? Cultish designs? Special calling cards? Preferences to the Blair Witch Project? Ah, fuck, I hope not. That piece of shit was a waste of time I'll never get back. I thought for free and I still wanted a refund. Well, they clearly mean something. There's a shit ton of them. Along with this stake with ornamental horns and a huge eye on top of it. Martha clearly states the family works for Satan, so... Maybe it's a message of the devil's eyes see all. I mean, we see eyes everywhere in hell. So it does make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. When did Martha have time to change her earrings? They turn from the turquoise drop earrings into two different animal skulls. A bird skull on her left ear, and a vermin skull on her right. Looks like a squirrel or a chipmunk. Want to know something even stranger than that? Our last little blink and miss it moment for this episode. When we return to the house with Moxie one final time, he attempts to summon 911, but accidentally uses the universal remote. That's clear. What you may not notice was the cartoon playing on the family TV. So what? It's just playing a random show. Lots of shows have random shows playing on TV for filler. That's the kicker. You'd think it was something random the crew threw together, but it's not. It turns out that this show is actually an old piece of Warner Brothers World War II propaganda, featuring the character Private Snafu, a character who had some of his shorts written by Dr. Seuss of all people. The shorts of that character fall under public domain, so the Spindlehorse team were free to use it. The particular short shown here is Hot Spot, a short in which the devil himself travels to Iran, the furnace of the Middle East. He discusses the country's climate, terrain, and infrastructure, as he watches Snafu and the troops transport cargo through it on their way to Russia. The devil is actually the character seen on the TV in this scene. Seems appropriate considering the Satan worship the family seems so proud of. Private Snafu? What kind of name is that? Well, Snafu is probably referring to the military phrase. Yeah, it means situation normal all fucked up! <laughs> I was going to say that. Yeah, that fits this family well. And what a note to wrap up on. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you may have learned a little something new about your favorite Hell Crew. Well, I learned that Dr. Seuss worked on World War II propaganda. And isn't that the greatest lesson of all? Blitz! That's it, fuckers! 
I'm gonna fucking kill that Amber. Welcome back to Things You May Have Missed. Today, we're looking at episode two, Lululand. Things sure got explosive in this episode. From the feels to the action, this one hit really hard. Speaking of hitting hard, our first little detail is a bit of a doozy. If you look on Octavia's wall when Stolz goes to check on her, one of the drawings is only of the two of them. Given the way Stolz talks about their connection later on in the episode, and how Stella makes Stolas check on Octavia? Is it possible she feels a deeper connection to him than to Stella? Speaking of a deeper connection with Stolas, did you see all the star charts, constellations, and the telescope in Octavia's room? She even had some of them in her teenage room. Could this be part of that connection with Stolas? Or maybe her royal training as his heir? Well, they just give us more and more to show that bond, don't they? We caught a little glimpse of it when we saw Octavia's drawings earlier, but as Stolas leaves her room after singing You'll Be Okay, we can see a rather large portrait of, again, Stolas and Octavia, but no Stella. They seem really happy. Um, right. Let's move ahead. A couple of years, it seems. To the present day, Stolas opens the fridge to get a snack for his plant pet, and we see not only a carton of chalky milk, I love that they called it that, but also a can of... Is that Hell's version of a specific cola brand? The design and textile? Let's just say... I wouldn't be surprised if that had said Hella Cola on it. Okay? <laughs> Here's a quick blink and you miss it moment. We see the poor imp still threw around all beaten and battered, holding up the phone for Stolas. Either that imp has a lot of stamina and a high pain tolerance, or is used to this treatment. I really hope it's the former. Shortly after, when Stolas causes both Blitz and Octavia to perform quite a spit take, we can see Octavia is eating a bowl of Mammon's greed seeds. Sounds like a cereal from hell, and I'm going to take a shot and say it's not too healthy for you. Considering the side of the box reads, INGREDIENTS. No one cares if diabetes exists, then why is it so hard to spell? Guess when most folks are already dead, there's no need to actually list ingredients. Hey look! It's our favorite new release mug! It is so cool that we can now buy Blitz's boss bitch mug! Ooh! He also has it on a picture! Is he trying to compensate for something? Looks like Blitz never got his phone back in the last episode. So now he's using a I Heart Horses Wild and Free phone case. Looks like the same phone he used to call Luna at the end of the last episode. Wonder how many spares he has. He must really like that wild and free lifestyle, because he has a poster in his office that matches his phone case. Someone's eye in a glass bowl. So, I know that everyone has hobbies, but collecting body parts? I mean, really? An eye in a jar? Wait, it's red. And an eye. Is that Mama Martha's eye? Did Blitz grab a souvenir? As the characters arrive at the front gate for Lululand, we see two big signs. One says, not this, with an arrow pointing towards what looks like a crossed out castle with an apple. The other says, not affiliated with Lulu World, with a red arrow saying, legally, we have to say this. Guess they had to be double sure people got the message. Well, they're clearly getting good money. Lululand hats are $69? Yeah, baby. There are seven posters we see on the wall as Moxie's trying to take care of Octavia. The first one is, everyone is mean to me. <laughs> Was this put up by Moxie? Number two, not Lulu World. Stop sending complaints. Oh, I'm sure they get nothing but complaints. Number three, Mad Cat Vodka. Stylish, sexy, sinful. Oh, look, sounds like something Angel would give to Husk. Number four, does Lulu World have a sexy robot? I don't know but I would prefer to go there and find out. Number five, I'd never do that to my BFF Lucifer. Then why the apple motifs? Number six, Mammon Cola. Real cocaine. It's better than sex. I'm not so sure we should test that theory. And number seven, Robofizz personal companion. I wouldn't mind having one of my own. But why is a robot machine washable? I can't help but wonder what this extermination game is. They have designs of the angel exterminators. 
maybe one of those shooting games, but you shoot the angels? I don't know about that. But hey, I found Waldo. Or at least his Imsona. And check out that merry-go-round. Those are some awesome horses. Kind of reminds me of the Spindle Horse logo. Okay, I definitely want a fizzy buddy. He laughs, sings, and swears. He's got over 100 lovable phrases. He's posable. He's only 48% ah, asbestos. Okay, maybe I don't want one so much. Tell your parents to buy me! What the fuck? Oh, what's wrong? Don't you want to take me home with you? you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I mean, what? No, fucking robot. The poster behind Octavia says Fizzerelli Jolly Hour, Friday through Sunday at 7 p.m. Free admission for Mammon Club members. I wonder how expensive that club is if the hats alone are worth 69 bucks. What's worse, the thought of that or the concession stands? Funnel cakes and infinite suffering? Are those two different items or just cause and effect? Ice cream bugs? What kind of flavors do you think they have there? Ant chocolate chip? And last, hot and cold drunks. Does that describe the menu or the patrons? Half away? And stop that soul? Those are some gruesome games. But that makes sense, seeing that it is a theme park in hell. I wonder if there are such games at Lulu World. Speaking of Lulu World, it looks like we have another sign in front of the circus tent that shows a castle with a large apple by it, circled and slashed through, saying, not this. Man, they really want to make sure people know the difference. Big time. RoboFizz even shows an official looking letter before starting his act. It reads, Attention. This is a statement regarding the unfair accusations that my theme park, Lulu Land, is in any way trying to profit off of my friend and ruler, Lucifer's Park, Lulu World. That is false. These accusations are baseless and untrue. You were all just dicks. Fuck right off and stop saying that, alright? They are legally distinct. I checked. Signed, Mammon. After RoboFizz launches Blitz out of the tent, we get a look at two more posters. One for Fizzer Raleigh and the Handy Dandies, which appears to be a puppet show. The other is a closer, more detailed look at the previous poster. One for RoboFizz personal companions. Apparently, they give and receive, have real tentacle action, 10 speed vibration, a BDSM feature, and are machine washable and ribbed for your pleasure. Fucking hell, I've got to get one. Ask and you shall receive! Fuck! All night long. Do you have to keep popping up like that? <laughs> Why? Don't you want to take me for a test drive? Get out of here! We'll meet at my place later. Okay, next. Um, I... <clears throat> I need a drink. Oh my gosh, these bills say a hundred souls. They're using souls as currency. So much for it being a hundred bucks. Yeesh. Hold on. The apple target falls forward. No matter what, there'd be no winning. We should have known. Carnival games are always rigged. It's nice that those two can still try to win things. Meanwhile, Blitz and Fizz are duking it out in the background. And after Fizz launches Blitz into the game stall, destroying it, Moxie grabs the thing and drags it off the table. Guess it's fine as steal from a thief, as long as it's for love. Has anyone else noticed that Stolos' hat changes moods? We saw a hint of its eyes moving when Octavia questioned Lulu, but when Stolos gets upset that Bliss isn't the one saving him, his hat appears to get just as annoyed. The hat then gets a bit of a cheeky smile before going back to the usual smile. Then it starts to frown when Stolos goes to look for Octavia. And it gets downright sad when he finds her crying. Oh, bless. Speaking of crying, during one of the most touching moments, we have a heart-to-heart -heart cry sesh. But something's different this time. Unlike during the opening scene, Octavia's tears go from blue to translucent. I wonder if there is a significance to that. After that wraps up and the Glacier duo make their way out, we have some fun with the IMP crew finishing off Fizz. Two blink and you'll miss it details here are that Millie is a badass bitch, rocking the dual pistols trying to take him down. Meanwhile, Moxie is riding the dragon and has he eat Robofizz. 
And finally, as the imps lie, drained but victorious, a chupacabra drags Millie away. This beast bears a striking resemblance to Val's pet Queef, as seen in Val's old Instagram posts. Maybe he's just scrounging around for whatever he can find. Can't say I blame the thing. Millie is quite a snack. Speak for yourself! Well, I could just eat you! Oh. Um. <clears throat> okay. That's it. Bedroom. Now. <laughs> yes, madam! Okay. I'm gonna sign this off before things get too crazy. Save that for episode 7, am I right? Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, I'm Crimson. And I'm Jasmine. We decided to go over some of the details that you may have missed from this episode. Let's get to it. Before telling you all of the details, can we just point out that this episode is the first episode in which Stolas doesn't appear in Hell of a Boss? I'm gonna miss that, bud. You might not know that Vizzy has an official Instagram for Blitz. Going through it, he seems to be really obsessed with horses. This is interesting because this episode is the first time we can see any reference to it in the show itself. Right at the start, we can see that Blitz has a tiny horse toy hanging from the ceiling of his van. Seeing as Moxie is a fan of Phantom of the Opera, and probably musicals in general, it's not surprising that he hates death metal. We can see him covering his ears as Blitzo blasts it on their way to work. All the while, in the same shot, we see Millie popping her head out of the car window, enjoying the scenery. I guess opposites do attract. Apparently, someone was trying to insult Blitz with the sign hanging from the building, but switch the F and the B. Someone didn't do well in school. Even in hell, they sell holy water to get rid of their own demons. How unfortunate. We won't even describe why this car is in the wall. Maybe this is how somebody died? Is this referring to Sharpe Evans from the High School Musical movies? Someone in this realm must really idolize her. Wait, could it be Busy Pop herself? Right at the very left side of this shot, looks like someone is simping for Valentino by the looks of this message. And it's signed SH. Wonder who it could be? Maybe it's our very own voice actor, Shiro Kitsune? Hey! This tank appears to be cleared for use in disabled parking spaces. No wonder those spaces are so big if the people who use them are driving tanks. There's a Batmobile in this parking space. Someone in Hell must really like the superhero. Or could Batman be here too? There is also a van in this parking space with the humunculus symbol from Full Metal Alchemist. Very interesting! In the beginning shots with the IMP van, did you notice that the license plate is IMP-666? Blitzo's megaphone is designed as a clown, considering that he had a run-in and passed with them. The voice actor that voices Veraska in this episode is none other than Christina V. She is no stranger to voice acting, as she is famous for her role in Miraculous Ladybug and Robin Hill from Ruby. What a legend! Veraska's license plate says Suck or Life. She's really not hiding the fact that she's a succubus, is she? This mural is a reference to the timeless classic song, Where the Rats, from Rat Movie Mystery of the Mayan Treasure. The red spray paint is the same as one of Alistair's symbols when he says, I would have already done so. Wonder if we have a fan or simply someone else who knows voodoo. Did you recognize the voice of Vortex in this episode? He is voiced by James Monroe Iglehart, the actor who played the genie in the Broadway version of Aladdin. This guy is a legend with a legendary singing voice. Maybe Tex has a magical singing voice as well. Can't wait to hear it. It looks like somebody doesn't like the IMP services. Is this their version of a bad review? I wonder what went wrong. At the back of the van window, it looks like Blitzo made custom family stickers for the whole squad. When Moxie freaks out about Millie asking Blitz what sex with Ferocica was like, Millie points out that Moxie once wanted to know what sex was like with Michael Crawford. This is a hilarious line in the scene because Michael Crawford is famous for playing the musical theater icon, the Phantom from the Phantom of the Opera in the original Andrew Lloyd Webber production. 
The fact that Moxie knows who Crawford is, despite not growing up on Earth, and is interested in the idea of having sex with him, tells us a lot about his character. Also, can we just point out that there was a fuck ton of weapons in the backseat of the IMP van? I mean, how else are they going to assassinate their targets? When Blitz throws the van keys to Millie, we can actually hear a Super Mario sound effect as she runs and jumps to grab the keys. Very spot for that truck. Okay, Looney, Moxie, let's go here. The license plate of a white van in the parking lot says Innuendo Hell. Could there be creepers hiding in that van? Luna almost called Blitz of Dad. How cute. When Luna takes out her mirror, we can see that the words strong but sensitive are written on the back. That pretty much sums up Luna. According to YouTube's closed captions, Vortex states that there wasn't room on the second floor. However, the fandom wiki says there wasn't room on the second floor. Was this a YouTube error or does he mean sucky floor for the succubuses? Did anyone ever notice that when the demon's eyes glow, they're a different color? Is this another representation of their races, or does it represent their sin? When they're in the studio, the succubus and incubus have wings and different colors for their horns than the imps. Roscoe also has different colors and designs for her horns and wings. Maybe this signifies her as the leader? Speaking of cosmetics, check out Verosica's tech too. Boy, she really didn't take her breakup with Blitz well, huh? This Incubus has a Burn Force Burn t-shirt, a classic Forrest Gump reference. Verosica has a heart-shaped tail tip, while the imps have an arrow-shaped tail tips. Apparently, Imp City was established in 1981, as this sign suggests. If you've been following Blitz's Instagram, you probably know that he's constantly renaming his horse. Well, it doesn't look like he's stopping anytime soon. Look at that list of potential horse names on the whiteboard. Actually, one of those names, Paperclip, is the actual name of a real racing horse. In the paper drawing animation scene, Blitzo is very creative at naming things, especially judging by what he named the boat in his drawing plan. There's also a snake hidden among the sharks, skulls, and geese. The children of a series of unfortunate events had to deal with hidden snakes and eels. Could this be a foreshadowing of an issue occurring in the ocean? Luna's hat says bye bitch when they celebrate. After Blitzo explaining his plan, Luna comes in and mentions that they should use their human disguises. Do you have a human disguise? Yeah, don't you? Yeah, so much simpler than that. Here we can see a picture of Blitz standing next to someone who looks very similar to him. His sister? In the scene where the demons are lined up, there is a little store called Erotic Cakes. Is that a reference to the shapes or the ingredients? I can't tell. That part where the character breaks the fourth wall and stare at the audience, disapprovingly, is a reference to the Vizipop fandom obsession with Luna and fan art. Way to call us out, Viv. In the line of demons, we have several different people pop up. One of them is Travis from Hasbin Hotel Pilot, as he makes a reappearance. I wonder who he is taking a hit out on. This imp with the bubble drink is an artist imp Sona. What a cameo. But it isn't the only one. The imp with the fox mask is also an imp Sona of one of the artists. One of the demons has a vote for me pin. I wonder what they're voting for. Also, the imp from episode 2 who is in Lulu Land is in the line as well. Having a human disguise isn't the only new ability we see Luna make use of. When she smells the list of targets, they become highlighted for her. Is this part of her powers as a hellhound? Later on in the episode, when Moxie tries to run away but gets picked up by humans, he is surprisingly very small compared to them. No wonder he's called a possum. When Luna first transforms, she doesn't have any lipstick, but the closer she is to Tex, the more lipstick she has on her face. Could this be a sign that she is maturing emotionally? There's a poster of an ACDC reference on the wall behind Blitz. The dumpster has a face! I guess it's a popular dumping ground. Looks like this shop is selling ice cream of all flavors. Strawberry, peanut butter, unflavored, and... regret? Did anyone notice Verasca's devil form in the smoke? Did you see the split-second insult with Verasica's face at the bottom that flashed on the screen at Verasica's concert? We did. 
This t-shirt is definitely a reference to Cool and the Game. This woman who we see flirting with these two dudes on the beach which looks an awful lot like Cherry Bomb. Even the hairstyle is kind of similar. Could this be inspired by Hasbin Hotel's Cherry Bomb? During Veruska's song, you can see hearts flowing around each of the succubus and incubus when humans look at them. Even Blitzo says, God damn it! That bitch started her goatish mating call! In Dizzy Pop's cartoons, you never know what to expect. Like, for example, a bunny rabbit toy in a pool of vomit. Some fans have noticed a similarity between this shot of Blitz splitting a guy's head open and this shot from the Hasbin Hotel pilot when Angel Dust kills an egg boy. I guess we're starting to see the similarities between Angel Dust and Blitz. Luna was so excited to meet Vortex, she made a pock face. Maybe Twitch should use this as their new emote instead. Why the fuck is there a catfish in the ocean? It's not native. Above Luna's head, there is a billboard advertising, extinguishing the heat with Eversnuff. I wonder if it can extinguish the heat rising to Luna's face. Sea cream instead of ice cream? Cause, you know, the beach. Did Blitz just materialize out of thin air between the two hounds? While talking with Vortex, a dog whisper sound effect can be heard in the background a couple of times. Oh. Parties. Nice! <laughs> Let's get you some friends, girl. Come on, Looney Tooney! It looks like she has a crush. Anyone notice the hellhounds have normal ears? while the Succubi and Incubi have pointed ears in their human form? While Millie and Moxie jump around the town killing people, a billboard in the background says, Notice me, senpai. Don't worry, we notice. According to the split second page that Blitz shows Luna, Blitz is really dedicated to his horse. He wants to kill people just so he can spend the money on his horse. In this episode, we find out that Luna was nearly 18 when Blitz adopted her. So, what happened to her family? Blitz holds his arms as he has a look of realization that Luna doesn't actually care about him. Could Robofist have been right? This kid is wearing the official Strange Seb Weirdovich, who is not affiliated in any way with Weird Ale Yankovic. Looks like Santa has his own brand of vodka now, reserved only for the nicest kids. And maybe a sip for the adults. Right after Millie kills the fish monster, did you notice that Moxie's tail makes the shape of a heart when talking about Millie? Millie has a black heart tattoo on her right shoulder similar to the one Veronica has under her eye. However, in this shot, she has one on each shoulder. Was this an animator error? There's a sign behind the succubus and incubus faces that says Happy Ho Special, where apparently you can get a free drink for every article of clothing you take off on a Thursday. I'm not sure I want to participate in that. Moxie's messed up face in the sand. So round, so cute. After getting friend zoned and losing all hope, Luna enters into the portal with a dramatic fall. Remember when we mentioned that this succubus could be inspired by the look of Cherry Bomb? Well, if you look at her leg, you can see that there is an apple and snake tattoo. Could this succubus be affiliated with Lilith in Hell? When the police show up to arrest Veronica and her gang, there's a bomb disposal drone which seems to have had googly eyes, rabbit ears, and a tail glued on it. That's pretty strange, but honestly, I'm more curious as to why there is a bomb disposal drone there in the first place. If that isn't funny enough, a clown is mining this riot policeman right behind him. He even shaped a balloon to look like a baton. At the end of the song, Blizzard can be heard crying out, Oh my god! I just went through puberty twice! So this is what we noticed from this episode. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any of our content. See you next time! There's a hundred and four things you may not have noticed from Hell of a Boss episode four. And with this little list, we get to show you what's in there. You won't believe what we have in store. Like maybe the gate has three ice your ribs have a section of heaven apart from the rest. A reference to Thomas, a man cave as well. Emojis that look so depressed. 
Jet Rib is registered. Newspaper headline gag, a shark, bear, rat, and a cat. Resort shaped like a heart. God can be kind of sus and even a pilot callback. As you can see, there's a whole lot of stuff to miss when you watch episode four. Come on, Crimson. So watch our vid to get the full list, cause we got plenty more. So watch our vid to get the full list, cause we got plenty more. I don't know what the hell that was, but can we get back to what we were actually doing? The cherubs seem to be in a separate town from the rest of heaven. Just like the imps. I guess they are the imps of heaven, huh? There are three eyes above the gate leading out of the cherub city. I'm guessing that gate leads to other cities up in the clouds. Didn't I mention this in my song? Uh... Did anyone see the face of the front of the train? Look familiar? Usually if you have a poster claiming it's a man cave, then it's not really a man cave. Ouch, way to call people out. There is an emoji of a crying cherub on the side of the screen. The poor thing. Cherub is registered. I guess that means that they do care about HR and content infringement in heaven. On the ground, there is an upside down newspaper that actually reads, in other news, Huge Dork reads this newspaper upside down in cartoon. Experts say, sad as hell. Wasn't this the one you found? Wait a minute, hey! A shark, bear, rat, and a cat. Oh my. The cherub's headquarters is shaped as a heart for their building. Charlie was right about at least one thing in heaven. God is sus. Surround yourself with people who will lift you up, so ditch your loser friends who you can't use. Sign God and Nolan is one of the posters in the office. See the sign that says injured? Good? Oh yeah, the doctors from the pilot! I remember them. If somebody doesn't stop video bombing, they're going to get injured! Alright, fine, I'm going for now. If you look at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see an empty bottle with the Holy Spirit, all the ALC on it, and a phone with chipper anime icon. Guess the guy was both drunk and on his phone. No wonder he needs the cherub's help. As the cherub commercial is being played, there is a sudden explosion destroying the TV. Then one second later, we see Blitzo with a gun. Those TVs must get great reception to get commercials from heaven. And as Moxie flips through the channels, we see the 666 News logo pop up. Guess Katie Killjoy is so bad that she's not even worth shooting. Blitzo looks like an old man. Foreshadowing? As they continue to flip through the channels, we briefly see a nude Betty Boop. Millie got a double chin and Blitzo got wrinkles. More old people foreshadowing? The Kentucky Fried Salesman from the Lululand episode who was selling random torches is back. His name is Wacky Wally Wackford. How many jobs does this guy have? Did you know that Wacky Wally is a Willy Wonka or Looney Tunes reference? Here's the spindle horse image again, but now we see a don't written on the top left of the picture. Wonder what it's referring to. The picture of Luna and Blitzo directly behind Luna is too cute. Family photo! On the whiteboard is an image of Robofizz getting eaten by a dragon. Same as what happened in the previous Lululand episode. Wonder if this is more foreshadowing that he will be back in later episodes. That or Blitch just really hates the guy. There is an image of Veraska drawn in a car with a sign saying Imp two miles back from episode 3. Guess Blitzo really is holding a grudge about that parking space, is he? Both Millie and Luna are panicking, but claiming that Moxie is the one panicking. Luna even calls Moxie fatty and says to stop getting hysterical. Denial's not only a river in Egypt. Too bad that Moxie is on the receiving end of their wrath, though. Poor Moxie. A double shield with wings? Very spooky. Luna is on all fours and ready to attack. I guess the thought that hellhounds make excellent guard dogs was true. No wonder Tex was Verasica's bodyguard. On the poster of the amazing Imp Twins, we clearly see Blitzo without his white mark. What happened to it? Also, looking at the poster of the amazing Imp Twins, Blitzo and Barbie Wire, we finally get to see a clear view of Blitz's twin sister. Hopefully we get to meet her soon. 
Millie has a battle axe. Man, why does Millie get all the cool toys? Why did Blitz sniff his butt? Luke Goop tells Luna, Shut up, dear furry! Ouch! Seeing her reaction, I wonder if she has been called that before. The tour guide's hat and shirt sleeve both have the symbol of a dollar sign on it. The shirt sleeve symbol is already backwards, but the hat actually switches. There is a sign on the left that says, I have trillions. The green band and pocket switch sides on the tour guide's t-shirt. Could this be a bit of foreshadowing that the guy they're supposed to off has a change of heart? We have a badass trio. Kitty Sock Puppet on Blitzo. Millie is sporting twin knives. Blitzo has his trusty pistol, and Moxie has a rifle. What could possibly go wrong this time? Free stock photos. Picture all those $100 Franken bills. I wouldn't mind that. Tacky stalkers. Yet, no one calls the cops. The imp trio is eating popcorn and drinking soda while watching the old fart trying to commit die. Looks like the cat puppet is blasting off again! Much to Blitz's sadness and sprinkle dust. This is the first time any holy beings have officially appeared in the series to speak directly to other characters and have impactful actions. Like, seriously! Where were they in the previous episode? Blitz really loves breaking things. Windows get ruined a lot in this series. And yet Moxie opens the door like a smart imp. You think he used Luna's advice and tried using the door like a normal person? Where did the old guy's wallet show up? It wasn't there before. Revolvers in three colors! And just look at that satanic chainsaw! A katana? Why, Moxie? You're not a ninja turtle! After Moxie pulls out a katana, the cherub says he's classier than that. What is classier than a katana? Millie puked. That's not nice. Puking in somebody's home? Now, granted, the old guy does stink. Blitz is dressed as a striped cat with a spike collar, and Millie is so cute as a cat. If you look closely, you may recognize their cat outfits. They are three characters from the musical Cats. Guess with his love of musicals, Moxie got to pick out these outfits, and nice touch with the satanic collar. Blitzo's face with the sarcastic oh no is just funny. Both Moxie and Millie in kitty cat suits, hashtag couple goals, and the sound of a squeaky toy as Moxie and Millie bump fists slash paws. So adorable! Christmas sale 25% off! Apparently it's Christmas time during this episode, and no snow. I wonder where it is or if this is a Christmas in July kind of thing. So this scene has several things in it, so we're gonna break it up a little. The first one is a zoophobia reference with a bad luck Jack toy sitting next to Santa's chair. Looks like his bad luck is continuing as long as the imps are around. Guess the person who made the sign wasn't very good at spelling. They misspelled Santa as Sant, uh... Maybe you guys noticed, but there's an ice cream shop that says ice cream since 1993. There was actually a movie called Ice Cream made back in 1993, so nice nod to the movie. One thing we noticed, the kid sitting on Santa's lap actually has a knockoff version of Pikachu on his shirt. Guess Pokemon's even big in the has-been universe. This kid in the center is wearing a Minecraft merch shirt, but instead is renamed to Craftmine. <laughs> To the kid picking his nose and eating boogers? You're not being sneaky! Everyone can see it, including Santa. And can I just say, ew? Blitzo and Millie are ironically dressed as elves and Moxie is Rudolph. He does not look too happy about that. I guess Moxie wanted to match with Millie again. Aww. Not only is Miss Mayberry's class in the picture, see the pink bow in the hair of each of her students, then there's the creepy at cutie Santa, and the kid either passed out or dead at his feet. Wow. Poor kid. Remember this girl with the pink bow from episode 1? It looks like she never fully recovered from being yeeted. The old man is literally crying like a baby. Santa's evil! Can also be heard being yelled by one of the kids. Man, I know the IMP crew are trying to ruin the guy's outlook on life, 
but really? As if those kids weren't traumatized enough. The sign says, the lovers look out, I guess. <laughs> Even the sign has given up at this point. The IMP trio looking mighty fine in their dresses. Look at Moxie looking sassy. And Millie has her hair pinned up with a bow. How cute. Blitz has a fluffy feather boa and looks like Veresica. Okay, mean girls. When Blitzo takes out his megaphone and screams, Hey, horny lovers, which one of you would fuck this old man? All of the five parked vehicles immediately drove off. I guess age does really matter. Moxie gets too real. We've all been there. Piss! In a bottle! Blitz appears to have a forked tongue. Guess he is more lizard-like than we thought. Here is an example of the worst timing to pause. Just look at Moxie. Now Blitz has a normal, I'll bet, long tongue. And the Moxie and Millie duo just look at each other stunned or excited. The unicorn's face changes expression, and we see the opera singer's eye pop out on the stage. Body parts everywhere! You may not know this, but the crowd is the artist who worked on the episode. They like to put themselves in. A total of 26. Thank you guys for all your hard work. Are those holy weapons? Can they kill demons on a permanent basis too? You briefly get a Zelda reference with the tiny fairy theme as Cletus starts to summon his weapon. And Cletus cursed, calling the old man shitty, saying that they will save his life even if he wants it or not. That doesn't sound too cash money of them. Whatever happened to free will? Blitzo holds a jewel-encrusted green horse with a weird cutie mark on its flank. And it got sunglasses! <laughs> Don't forget that you hear a horse neighing at this time, too. I swear to God! As Blitz says, he's gotta go, most likely talking about the old man, he points at Moxie. And yes, Moxie also notices. Millie's tail is pointed towards Kenny, almost like a dagger or a warning. I wonder if Kenny is going to heed this warning. Bitch fight, and Millie holding Blitz is so adorable. But we can see that Kenny and Millie are the exact opposite of each other, though Kenny cursed a few moments ago. Judgmental cotton candy, tit having bitch! Someone is a little jealous. Also, Millie grabs Kenny by her bead necklace. Filthy demon! Kini and Millie are in a tussle. Fight! 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 Ugh. Kini also bites Millie's arm. Ouch! Millie and Moxie kiss like there's no tomorrow. She takes out two guns and sets the stage ablaze, while Moxie holds her and spins like crazy. Such a touching moment. We see both Moxie's bow tie come off as well as Millie's black bra. It is confirmed! She wears a bra! In this shot, it shows that you can choose either good or evil depending on their choices. The old man realizes this as both while the cherubs and imps fight. Where was the old guy hiding that money? On second thought, I don't want to know. It's all wrinkly. It bet sweaty too. Ugh. Blitzel runs out of bullets and throws his gun at Cletus in the eye. Instead of saying something holy, Cletus curses again. I don't know if you guys noticed, but Blitz's gun actually resembles the fish from the last episode. Interesting. So how did Moxie and Millie get tied up exactly? We see the shadow of the piano clearly, but when the old man moves, the piano follows. Hey, that's Crimson's line. We see the old guy get crushed. Finally! Millie gives the cherubs two middle fingers up. IMP for the win. So apparently, just like Blitz, Kenny has heels naturally on her feet, like pointy spikes. And she slaps Colin, telling him not to say the Lord's name in vain. Appropriate, but still beating him. Hmm. Millie sticks her tongue out teasingly at the cherubs. Keeney, having enough of their shiz, is the one who opens the portal to heaven. 
The entrance to heaven has been denied. Confusion ensues. The other cherubs have names. They are Rachel, Theory, Bea, Bew, and Honey. This can be found on Twitter and the names during the credits. At least for Deary, who is voiced by Vizzy Pop herself. Vizzy Pop also voices Kine. Colin asks if there was any way for them to get back into heaven. To which Deary says, Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. So, what does that say about redemption? And does that mean we get to see these three again? Deary says, But those are the rules. Yeah. Who makes them? Here is a better, clear image of both RoboFizz and Veroska Doodles on the board. Blitz really doesn't like them. Blitz text messages don't look too good. If you look at the one from Loopty Goopty, it says, You fail, you die. Also, Blitz has another new phone, and he labeled Loopty Goopty as Lupus in his contacts. One other thing 536 messages? Who the flip is calling or messaging Blitz? Probably stole this. There is a poster on the back wall called The Incredible Blitz. If he hates the O so much, why does he have so many posters with it? The old guy, Lyle Lipton, that died has piano keys as teeth. I guess how they died does affect their afterlife form. And poor Moxie, he just can't catch a break. But he does get a crush. Lyle wow, Lipton? This is a Scooby-Doo reference on the reveal of Old Main Jenkins. Uh, I, I mean, Lyle Lipton. What the frick, Wacky Wally? So creepy how he just sent them or heard the question slammed right in. Blitz apparently makes Moxie fix the damage walls, which means Moxie might be a great handyman. I, uh, mean imp. But then we see a shot of him stuck under the escalator foaming at the mouth. What is he ever going to catch a break? <laughs> Blitz makes a sex joke. Wait, really? And then he says Satan's balls and heaven's table scraps. Oh, well, this implies that the cherubs aren't that powerful or high up on the hierarchy of heaven. Fairly accurate in terms of the actual religion. Wacky says Blitz has a holy operation here, implying the events of this episode and the literal holes in the building. A sweet note at the end of the credits. In loving memory of Adriana Margarita Rodriguez Hernandez. That is so sweet. And yes, we did see it. And that was all of the details that was in episode 4 of Hell of a Boss. First up, number 1. The warning changes again to include, as well as rampant demon horniness. So, yes, it's intended for mature audiences. End quote. Point two. Blitzo has a lighter with an eye on it. Hell has a lot of eyes watching, and his cigarette has an M logo on it. What could it mean? Number three. Blitz and Stolis share an after-sex smoke. Aw, how sweet. Point four. Yes, it is revisited that fire doesn't really hurt imps, so no cigarette burns for Blitz. Number five. Blitz coughs up one of Stolis's feather, implying quite a bit there. Point six. Okay, so this wasn't really missed, but this image gave birth to so many memes. Like Stolis is a Jedi or he becomes a sexy nun. Honestly, Vizzy and her team knew what they were doing here. Point number seven. Okay, so this is possibly a theory for another video, but Stolas emphasizes that he feels safe. I feel quite safe at the, at the Harvest Moon Festival. This would be true if he goes every year, but this time it seems different. This year is the first year where, for some time, he's been cheating on his wife with Blitz. So, maybe Stolas was lying about feeling safe and really wanted an excuse for the protection? Maybe Stolas knows more than he's letting on. Point 8. The sign says, Own Fizzerali's bought today, with a complete image of RoboFizz and a Mammon stamp. That sign was not there before in the pilot episode when we saw Millie and Moxie's home for the first time. Point number 9. 
Millie has daggers and knives lodged into her bedside and on her half of the bed frame. And, aww, their bed frame has a heart shape in it! Also, also, Millie appears to like sleeping on her side while Moxie sleeps on his back, noticing the consistency. And last, also, Moxie has a musical note alarm clock. How cute. Moving on. Point 10. Their eyes glow. Consistency is appreciated. And Phantom of the Opera ringtone? And is that a musical note wallpaper? Point number 11. The poster says The King. So, a reference to The King and I? Moxie really does love his musicals. Even Moxie's phone is music themed, stating, I don't cry, I sing, and decorated like a Broadway song. Point 12. Millie sleeps in a black lingerie nighty in her black choker while Moxie sleeps in blue striped pajamas. Classic. Point 13. Blitz looks like a cat with his adorable face and his tail curls up. <laughs> Oh, Millie has a cartoon sweat drop and Moxie just looks like a Tibetan fox who's tired of Blitz's shit. Yes, I said Tibetan fox, look it up. The most monotone face in existence. Point 14. The rough and tumbleweed ranch sign comes with barbed wire in another eye. Cactuses can apparently thrive in hell is good to know. Number 15. First look at one of the main IMP group's parents. Millie's mama is THICK, and her dad was voiced by Ed Bosco, the original voice for Alistair the Radio Demon. Point 16. Blitzo has another pony toy hanging from the mirror. Looks like a circus pony. How fitting. Okay, Blitzo. Point 17. Moxie's suitcase has a break a leg sticker, and the comedy and tragedy theater mask sticker. Point 18. The look on Luna's face when Blitz grabs her. WTF? And then Blitz's face goes cute mode again when he acknowledges Luna as his daughter. Point number 19. It reminds them of war? Like, war? War? Like, human wars or wars between heaven and hell? Mmm, I smell orbits. Point 20. Okay, Moxie is beyond cute when he starts to go on about his research I researched the history of weaponry and the love of weaponry to impress his in-laws. But he does mention angelic technology, which alludes to further plot of the episode. Also, another possible connection to the has-been plot with the Extermination Day angels and their holy weapon. Point 21. Blitz blinks his eyes like a lizard or a frog, one at a time and looking slightly dumbfounded. Point 22. Blitz! Stop it with the adorable eyes! Point 23. And how many times will Blitz keep referring to Mox's penis as tiny? How in heavens would he know? Plus, I'm sure that touching would be considered harassment, so HR? <laughs> Point 24. Blitz facial expressions? This episode knows no bound. We see hearts in his little imp eyes when he sees the horse Striker is riding on. Meanwhile, the other imps seem less impressed. Point 25. Hey, look! It's Daryl Dixon! I mean, Norman Reedus! I mean, Striker! Also, the sign behind him changed slightly. Now it has horseshoes hanging from it, and what appears to be an animal skull. Point 26. We learn that Millie's full name is actually Mildred. Noted. And oh my gosh, Stryker looks like an effing possum. Point 27. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. I'm so confused. What is going on with the exaggerated BYE FRIEND? Point 28. Stryker's tail extends as he realizes who Blitz is. Either the IMP company is truly getting around, or someone informed Stryker on who Blitz was specifically. Nudge nudge wink wink, maybe? Point 29. Blitz doesn't really seem to know how to take a compliment. Seeing as he probably gets more insults, his confused look says a lot. He doesn't even know how to respond to Stryker. It's odd to him. Poor Blitz needs more confidence in himself. Point 30. It's quick, but Blitz is using his fingers to demonstrate what he and Stolas do in bed. We even hear a little popping sound. But Moxie and Millie both know what's going on. Aww. Point 31. 
That side-sliding animation from Blitz was hilarious. He must really love games, but Millie, not so much. She immediately turned sour at the mention of them. In point 32, 15 separate funerals? And in 15 separate funerals. But wait, they're in hell. So hellborn beings can die from things other than angel weapons? Where exactly do they go? <laughs> Where exactly do I go? To double hell? <laughs> More bits of lore being thrown our way. Point 33. What is up with these faces? Millie has become a pouty pufferfish. Point 34. Is that an actual body or a dummy? Either way, that's funny and disturbing. Also, Sally Mae is Millie's sister. According to the wiki, she's trans. Looking at her horns, they are striped just like the males, but she identifies as a female. And damn, she's just as hot and cute as Millie. And then, look at their cute little brother doing all the heavy lifting. Point 35. First off, Moxie's sad baby face is precious and we must cuddle and protect. Secondly, Millie's pa calls Moxie a Sensitive thespian type. I don't think sensitive thespian type. So even though Moxie was born in the Ring of Wrath, was he the only one different from the other country imps living there? What about his family? Point 36. Muna's phone case changed, and this is the same image used to tease the episode on Twitter. Point 37. So is Striker part Rattlesnake too? Because his tail shakes and we hear it rattle like, plus he hisses like a snake too. Telling a lot about his character, really. His tail is circled around Moxie as if he was a target. Point 38. The windmill has blades, and it looks like it has dried blood on it? Point 39. The speakers have skulls of in is that, I say, is that Wally Wackford? He's making another appearance in this episode, too. The last time we saw him was in episode four, Cherub. And for the first time in episode two, Lululand. Point 40. Do all demon microphones have an eye and look evil? And why does Wally look like the Kentucky Fried Chicken Colonel? Maybe he's just a Southern gentleman. Point 41. You can start to hear Stolas' theme music, which is normally slow and regal, being influenced by the southern twang of a banjo and made country. Point 42. When Stolas talks about the spoils of the imp's labor, we can clearly see that they are not very amused. Something about being talked down to by rich, spoiled folks just doesn't sit right with them, and I kinda agree. The system in hell seems just as messed up as in heaven. But you can see the resentment in the imp's expressions. Stolas really doesn't have a clue, does he? Point 43. Wacky has his own logoed starting pistol. Point 44. There appears to be a female demon with black horns and thin white stripes, but white hair? Interesting. Also, Moxie just got trampled by so many imps, including one of the bigger male imps. Then we see a buff looking imp, claw like markings all over their arms and face, and a little female imp with long goat like horns wearing a cowboy hat while doing the Naruto run, and a large dust cloud containing horns, tails, and red limbs all rushing to compete and trampling Moxie into the dust. Point 45. Moxie's face! We've seen it before in episode one, Murder Family, when he wheezed and gasped like a broken squeak toy. Also, the one fear, Demon Shark. Six glowing red eyes, a mouthful of rows and rows of sharp teeth, and a bad attitude. Point 46. Just look at these two cute imps watching Blitzy get all hogtied by Stryker. <laughs> 47. Okay, we've got a lot to unpack here. First, look at the various imps in the stands. Some of them might be the imp sonas of the artists, animators, and cleanup crew that worked on this episode. In fact, the one to the far right with the yellow glasses sort of looks out of place, don't you think? And the three imps over to the left side stands all have their eyes wide open and visible. They might be impsonas too. Meanwhile, in the foreground, we have Stryker, Blitz, and Moxie facing off against three other competing imps. 
Blitz is using his teeth on the rope. Oh, what an animal. Point 48. Again, possibly more imp sonas as we see an imp on her phone, two of them cheering, one lady imp with a bandana, Millie's brother maybe, and a mother imp shielding her child's eyes. What? Is this too graphic for them to see? It appears that the Stolas and Wacky are enjoying the scene from above, though. Point 49. And maybe it's a bit too exciting for Stolas, as he's leaning over the railing and Wacky is having none of it. Yeah, Stolas, keep fanning yourself, you hot and thirsty bird. Point 50. That shark is relentless. He has a personal vendetta against Moxie. And Moxie was literally about to curse before being cut off. But we all know what he was going to say. Point 51. Wacky's face says it all. How dare this bird take my mic again? Damn it, Stolas! Point 52. So many people worked on this episode. Just look at the different imps drawn into the scene, even though we don't see their faces. We count seven imps total that stand out. Can you find them all? 53. <laughs> Striker's song is bringing imps to tears. Just look at the detail on these impsonas. These are the artist and crew guys. And one even has a little bee pin in her hair. <gasps> but we have certainly seen these imps before in past episodes. Or revealed on Twitter. Point 54. Speaking of which, Little Miss Bee Pin Imp just got kicked by Stryker, yet is so blinded by love. Her eyes are filled with hearts. She can't even see she's about to be attacked by the other jealous imps. We've seen each of these imps throughout the episode. Whoa. <laughs> Saying the word imp is making me tired. Also, pentagrams. Pentagrams everywhere. 55. So, volcanoes with burning suns on top? Is this what all the wrath ring looks like? Is this why the sky is glowing a bright burning red? Point 56. Blitz is enjoying watching the horse eat. The pig carcass. And better view of the blade windmill. Yay! Point 57. We see Millie's other two brothers. One has a goat tattoo. Clearly, it's one of Satan. And both brothers are lifting jack o lanterns Point 58. So now we see a bull's head mounted in family photo of Millie, her parents, Sally Mae, and the three brothers. Big family. 59. A sign on the door says, Keep out. Whose room is that? Point 60. We can actually see Stryker reflected in Moxie's eyes. Point 61. If you listen closely, the sound Stryker makes is the hissing sound that alligators and crocodiles can make. So they used a mix of both snake hissing and gator hissing. Point 62. Stryker is the third character we officially know who has a gold tooth in their mouths. The other two being Angel Dust and Valentino. Number 63. Millie grabs Stryker by his bandana and literally stabs him in the back. The same way he, metaphorically, did to everyone else. Point 64. Millie's eyes are filled with rage, or wrath, as she is seeing red. If you look closely, she has upside down crosses as her pupils. She is vicious if you attack her hubby Moxie. And more consistency with the black blood that imps have. 65. So, Stryker just broke Millie's arm. You can actually see the bone fracture. Point 66. Millie's family cellar contains bear traps, hand axes, saws, meat cleavers, battle axes for chopping heads, spears, a sickle, bags of flour, boxes, and a lamp. 67. Stryker calls Blitz a rodeo clown. Again, fitting because of Blitz's past. But this also shows that Stryker never had a genuine respect for Blitz. 
there's more leverage with your rodeo clown of a boss if I don't. Point 68. More weapons in the basement. Another axe, a battle club like Negan's bat, and a Grim Reaper scythe. Point number 69. So the joke about Moxie asking about not being good with his hands implies things. But then we hear a thumping squeak sound coming from Millie as she gives Moxie a really babe kind of look. Like hitting a nail on the head. I'm not good with my hands. Oh, right. Point 70. Moxie has a gun with a musical note on it. Coming this summer, Moxie, get your gun to a theater near you. Call your local box office for tickets now. 71. Is that the same long-haired imp woman we saw in Blitz's coffee shop posts? And from episode 2? Point 72. The mic turned from red to purple and then back again. Number 73. From far left to right, we see B-Pin Imp Girl looking a bit beat up. And, well, the other imps that made appearances throughout the episode. Seriously, we can't repeat this enough. And if you listen carefully, you can hear an imp shouting, I told you he could open up the red thing in the sky. Like it was a conspiracy theory or something. Like, doesn't Stolas do this every year? Calm yourself, all right. Seventy-four. The sign says trident or pain. Point seventy-five. We noticed that in the past episodes. Some of the inanimate objects have faces painted on them, or look like faces. Here's another instance as the wall behind Stryker looks like a face. 76. As Stryker tries to convince Blitz to come to his side, we see that Blitz might genuinely be thinking and contemplating his life. He has a lot of darkness in his past, and we've seen glimpses of his own insecurities throughout the series. He doesn't have much true confidence in himself, and you know he wants power, or at the very least, to prove himself. Point 77. Stryker mentions slaying overlords, which has a direct connotation to Hasbin Hotel. We know there are indeed overlords as well as the nobility, so does this mean that we could get a crossover one day and see Stryker and Hasbin, or possibly get a look at the overlords from the Hell of a Boss perspective? Whoa, 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 calm down now. It's all just theories for now, but maybe we'll see what Bifty Pop has up her sleeve. When you could be slaying overlords. Point 78. We can see that Stryker's words may truly be getting to Blitz. The business or the system of hell is against Blitz, or possibly all limbs, as they seem to be considered the lower class, even below that of human sinners turned demon. Why is this? Point 79. Blitz's eyes are red and white instead of his usual yellow. Point number 80. We see Blitz gulping down in nervousness as Stryker stares him down. Is this... seduction? Point 81. Look at the picture behind Stryker. It's a picture of Spindle Horse! Number 82. A picture of Millie's parents when they were younger. Millie really does take after her mom. Point 83. This whole fight scene was epic. But to point out just a few things. One, Blitz is an awesome fighter. He can throw punches with his fists and his tail. Two, he managed to put a hole in the wall and is really dexterous with his tail. Three, he can even grab Stryker with it and manages to throw him across the room and into the wall. Point 84! What kind of store is Flaming Horns? Point 85! Luna is back in her normal clothes again, and Blitzo is being overly affectionate towards her as usual. Even though she's pretty much helped Stryker get away, and we won't fault her for that. Millie is also now in a leg and arm cast. 86. We may be pulling straws here, but... How many times will Blitz make the same big-eyed, adorable face in this episode? Point 87. The Hideaway Motel. No vacancy. The guy that tried to kill you, Death isn't here. 
number 88. So, the imp that still threw its stolas in Lululand is the one still holding the phone and literally hearing all the evil plotting going on. Still is the only one not with a plate of food at the dinner table. Meanwhile, Octavia is just vibing out to her loud music as she eats, and still is his reading at the table. Kind of rude, all things considered, but really, still is how thick could you get? Although, maybe he already knows Stella's out to get him? Mm. Point 89. Though by this point we see Stolas finally looking up at Stella and seems a bit bewildered, so maybe he really doesn't know she is out to get him? We will have to wait and see in future episodes. But on another note, both of their eyes are glowing red. Point number 90. The new gun striker has looks like it's still able to kill demons. It has the same glowing markings as the blessed tipped rifle, so he's still very lethal. Point 91. And last but not least, proof! Norman Reedus as Striker! What? What's going on? Chameleon? Crimson? What's going on here? Where are we? I don't know. We were supposed to be recording the newest What You Missed video, and suddenly we're here. Wherever here is. Well, we can't have gone too far away from the booth. Hello? Who's there? What do you want with us? What the f- Camille- Well, that was an interesting intro. I think it's appropriate for this video. <laughs> Indeed. And with that, let's get into the shiz. Starting out of the gate, the warning screen. It warns us of flashing lights as well as rampant demon horniness. So, yes, it's indeed for mature audiences, immediately breaking the fourth wall. Yay! And within the first few seconds of this episode, literally at timestamps 006, 007, and 010, we see that someone has been watching and recording our Imperos, question mark. They have been watching ever since Blitz and Moxie's tried murder in the murder family. Then again, with Millie at the beach after her battle with the unlikely catfish, that shouldn't be in the ocean, actually, now I think about it. And then at the Opera House, during the epic Cheer Up vs. Imp battle, and Moxie and Millie were getting it on! But oddly enough, we don't see the Cheer Ups. Weird. Yeah, that is weird. Moving on! At 12 seconds in, we see Blitz in a horse field looking like a dork, while carrying Boba Tea and Souls' book, yet again abusing the power given to him. Oh, and immediately after this, at timestamp 21, you can see a total of 18 monitors showing past events of the IMP team. Yeah, these guys were not subtle at all. <laughs> no, no they are not. But at 36 seconds, the double agent dorks see Blitz coming out of a dumpster in alleyway, just after remarking of how difficult it's going to be to find the imps. Eh, go figure. Around 47 seconds in, after getting up from the garbage, Blitzo covered in it, starts pointing his finger with a used condom on it, in Moxie's face. Gross. Who knows what horny teen or back alley hobos use that. Yeah, not gonna lie, that's, that's, that's not good. Anyway, at 52 seconds in, the male agent comes from the wrong gosh darn side, like their building is to Moxie's left, yet this guy comes from the right. Oh my god, at 54 seconds, he has a net launcher? Cool! He's Spider-Man! And now the female agent is coming down from the roof, but again, wrong side. And this is like at, what, 57 seconds in? Come on. What's up with you freaking out about them coming from the wrong sides? Does it matter? Yes! Yes, it does! 
it means that like literally these two dummies wasted time to go around their building and then you know went up and over and like timing it just feels off so like our imp team could have you know just jumped through the portal and back you know whatever and like these two dorks literally wouldn't have you know made it in time but i digress you know next thing y'all missed at one minute, they have already given us so much but to revisit the fact that Luna can read Stolas' book, making her a useful member of the team, but this seems to be a foreshadowing something. Also, looking behind Luna and Millie, we see that the office has been fixed since Luke D and Friends, and we see the norm. <laughs> Luke D and Friends. But anyway, up next at a minute and two seconds in, Moxie's pistol has a music note on it. So cute. We get another side uh, view of this at 104, where we see the other notes. Damn, Moxie, <laughs> you really love your music, don't you? I mean, he is a music, well, he is a music man, I guess. <laughs> get it, music man? So from 104 to 107, Moxie gets darted and starts speaking in tongues before making the cutest point to share face. Also, we think he says, I get the coloring book now, but that's up for debate. What? He does have the cutest face. It's, it's, just, so, it's just so cute. But at 109, let's throw the garbage lid at agent number one. Ooh, that's got a heart. Next up, at 111, Blitzo uses Moxie as a personal battering ram and slams into agent two's face. Batter up! And at 113, if you don't re if, like, you have to get real close up in this back alley because it's so dark. But again, there's like this movie poster on the wall saying, how do you pronounce that? Spurp, spurk, bleh, spurk two, whatever. Get everything. Uh, editors, you know what to do. Uh, not gonna lie, probably won't see it. Anyway, next. Oh, come on. With a title like that, it sounds just like how Blitz and Moxie feel at this moment. Because apparently at 114 through 117, Moxie can apparently smell colors. Good for him. Wish I could. Trust me. No, you don't. Wait, you smell colors? Mm, moving on. <laughs> at 126, as Blitz and Moxie get pretty much tasered, uh, we can see an array of shocking colors. There go them colors again. And we also see their skeletons. Worth noting that Moxie has a fracture over his right eye. Wondering how he got that. And their horns and their tails are, well, bony. That's pretty much what they are. They're bony. <laughs> it's so cute. Around 138, we start to hear Millie in her wrath mode, but it sounds like angry raccoons and squirrels mixed together. So scary. She's crying and she wants her hubby. Aww. And at 149, we briefly hear Luna giving a puppy dog whine. You know, because she has no clue how to comfort Millie, and is a bit awkward. So Luna has gotten to the point of learning Blitz more than we originally thought. At 155, she tells Millie that because Blitz did not use any euphemisms, innuendos, and or swears, that meant he was being serious. Noted for future episodes and things to listen out for. Righto! Next up at 203, we see a dingy looking IMP backpack with a message. Blitzo's emergency, I said Blitzo, but it's okay, it's Blitzo's emergency, spelled an actual C, you know, for a short version, bag, and has a horse shooting a gun in the corner. And at 204, we see an additional horseshoe pin and an enamel horse pin, so that's pretty cool. At 205, we see Millie bring back the company's axe, as it appears to be her go-to weapon of choice. It's so freaking sweet, I want it! Moving on. Get in line, huh? We all want that axe. So unless we're gonna fight for it, which, <laughs> bring it, uh, I say we move it along. So up next, at only two minutes and six seconds in, like damn, we see the return of Luna's human disguise. It's so awesome. But again, how did she get it? And like, I mean, okay, okay, uh, Fluff, tell me that you're seeing this. What is up with her Bugs Bunny shoes? Like seriously, what are those? That is a crime. I have no clue what those are, but they do look pretty snazzy. Mm, might just have to steal them. 
<laughs> Can't have <laughs> hell. <laughs> Moving on. Can't have Detroit. 218 to 219, Luna grabs Millie and stuffs her in the backpack. So cute. Like Banjo and Kazooie. Banjo and who? Moving on. Uh, uh, okay. At 234, both Blitz and Moxie's tails are intertwined and locked to a chain ball. That's so medieval. <laughs> Evil. <laughs> medieval. From 234 to 238, we learn that apparently Blitz took a lot of tranquilizers in college. Bad he had to drop out of. Good job. Live in the dream. Also, he's admitted to having his nipple strapped to a car back? Kinky? Huh, I can only imagine. And up next on our long list of, well, another fourth wall break. Yay! Uh, between 301 to 304, Blitz breaks the fourth wall by mentioning how people get coffee during these AKA scenes like this. So I guess like, you know, referring to shitty movies with interrogation scenes. Pretty much everything from like, back in the day. Or similar to the one right now. Where's my chalky milk, Crimson? Where is it? Where is it? Here's your coffee. Where's my chalky milk? No, you, oh my goodness, you're, you're not supposed to have chalky milk. Not until after we're done this, come on. The next one is a bit of a doozy, so here we go. At 306 to 327, Moxie goes on an impressive coffee rant and shows how particular he is about his coffee. Also, the barista does write his name wrong, calling him Roxy or Boxy, Foxy, Loxy, whatever the hell. But no one should be faulting our little Moxie B because man loves his coffee. Might not go with him to the shop since the ordering would take too long, but I respect the imp for his bold choices and beverages. I'm more of a tea person. You know, unless it's the frappuccino, because I love me my frappuccinos. Uh, anyway, I do like them cold slushies. Mmm, slushies. Oh, and extra pumps of mocha chocolate at the bottom. Oh, chocolate. Mmm. What were we talking about? And you say I have a chocolate issue. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, moving on. Yeah, but I don't think the agents appreciate Mossy's detailed taste very much since they get irritated, allowing Blitz at 332 to congratulate Moxie on being a chilled douche to the humans. We approve, and so does Blitz. Coming up at 355, what's his comment? Uh, <laughs> daddy like a dummy. Even Moxie got kicked out of that one. <laughs> Just so cute. Just so cute. <laughs> How could anyone not like that one? Plus, calling the agents <laughs> For the best, since at 2.56 onward throughout the interrogation, you should notice that back wall clock has no hands. How do they tell time here? I don't know, wristwatches? Uh, I mean, like, for goodness sake. But at 4.18, it is confirmed that Moxie is a Virgo. Nice. Might explain why he's so darn cute and innocent. I mean, like, for an imp, you know? May I present to you, at 456, welcome to dorks. We got two people on the roof, one with a giant floodlight, and many stories below. We have four cameras and just two people guarding the entrance, holding what appears to be a hybrid of a Japanese naganata and a butter knife. Like, seriously, what are those weapons? And at five minutes on the dot, like, how, like, how in the nine circles did the humans not see and or hear Millie and Luna, you know, pulling a sideways Michael Jackson moonwalk. Like, literally, you see them at the side of the building. Like, for reals! <laughs> and what's even worse, at 510, who the hell is not watching this side door? Like, they have all the security in the god world in the front, and yet this random door just goes under the radar. What the actual heck is this organization? Can I get mad now? Cheryl, honey, um, please calm down. <laughs> I am calm. <laughs> oh, so calm. It's just that this organization, who are they? What are they? I mean, why are they? They're called dorks! At 5 minutes and 17 seconds. Uh, uh, ew, dude, like, really? Spitting your probably still hot coffee at your coworker, you know, that won't make you many friends. Again, this is why I'm a tea person. Hmm, and at 5.16, there's a little sticky note at the bottom of the monitor. 
and it reads as follows. Call mom? Join DemonsAreRealDating.com. Also, for lunch, they are eating burgers from a greasy bag. The lunch of champions. And don't search up DemonsAreRealDating.com. I already did, and it, it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> of course you would. Now we get to the good stuff. At 5.20, we get to the fight sequence. Ay! The multitude of individuals in black are wielding various Japanese Edo period style weapons, ranging from katanas, sais, which are basically like little mini hand tritons, and you know, more of the rip-off naginatas, the nunchucks, and kamis with ball chains. So you know, let's go! Fight, 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 fight! <laughs> oh dear, Kitsune is hungry for a battle. <laughs> right I am. I want to see some action. But before we do that, let's draw some attention to 521 and look at the very back left-hand corner to see the oddly placed break room for the employees. They even have a water cooler and motivational posters with sayings like, keep hanging in there, and the accompanying image of a kitten holding onto a table, and then a motivational poster and a synergy poster and, and a happy face. I guess every office has one of these, but... Ooh, 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 blah, blah, blah. Okay, so at 525, spicy wires! <laughs> That's funny. And they also have a pamphlet stating, days, like, you know, day number since last incident. <sighs> this was that day. They went back down to zero. Haha. -ha. So yes, we had our dedicated Shiro and I go frame by frame on these next scenes since many of them were just too fast for some of y'all to get on the first watch. But starting at 523, Luna slices a dude's leg off with a battle axe while Millie pulls out what appears to be Beretta guns and lights up that same guy. One shot to the chest and one shot to the head for a double tap kill. At 525, Luna throws the battle axe straight into the guy's head. You know, talk about splitting headache. Hehe. <laughs> really, Shiro? Immediately after that, Millie uses the man as a climbing post to grab the axe and narrowly avoids the swing of a wannabe katana. We are getting into anime territory. And I repeat, we are getting into anime territory. As Millie slices his lady, I assume it's a lady. It is. She has a Karen Bob cut. <laughs> well, speaking of cut, this lady gets cut in half, and she has no clue where the manager was, so she, you know, come bust into blood. At 528, Luna performs a high jump kick and lands into an amazing split. Ooh, damn, girl. And she manages to slide back and pushes up into a somersault over the nunchuck guy. And then at 530, you know, Luna is wearing a sports bra, so... Yeah, so back away, you hungry Luna-obsessed individuals. We can't call you the S-word anymore. But anyways, at 5.31, Luna pulls a matrix, and the guy behind her suffers a decapitation while the commie gets caught in the wall. Good job. Y'all had one job. And at 5.32, Millie finishes off the last, or, you know, for now, guard with a snap to the neck. Wait. Oh no, there are more guards. How many of them exist here? Like, how much are they getting paid to just be here? No clue, don't care, because they picked the wrong day to come into work. But anyway, at 535, to the left we have the stairs. But the sign shows that someone doesn't know how to use the stairs and tumbling forward like a dumb <laughs> Then, just above the glass window, we see a sign saying, Attention, no magicians permitted. Ugh, so many questions. Oh, and lastly, we have, you know, these four schmucks thinking that they can, you know, do the impossible and take down our girls, Luna and Millie. Impossible. At 536, the main two guards suddenly pull out Ninja Star, seemingly out of thin air. Ooh, spooky. Doesn't help them much, though, since our hell team dodges them like a boss. While Luna throws Millie towards the agents, and then we get a close-up of Millie and her psychoness. I mean, well, she is from the Wrath Ring, so, you know, that makes sense. At 542, we see that, you know, the alarm is out of order. Seriously? Like, what is this shit? What is this shit show of an organization? I'm done. I'm done. I'm just so done. You, you really have it out for this group, don't you, Shiro? 
Look, I can't help it. Like, they just, uh, they, they just seem to be, you know, asking to get bumped off. Like, I need, I need a drink. I need a drink. I think these agents need more than a drink. Since at 546, one of the agent's arms falls from the ceiling. Millie went ham in bone on these guys. <laughs> also, uh, the dismembered body parts are, um, they looking kind of sus. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Shiro. What? I'm just saying. <laughs> Continuing on at 548, Luna comments calling Millie an old lady. However, Millie retorts that she is only five years older. So if Luna is 18, then that places Millie at 23 years old. Ooh. At 624, we have, oh, pretty green buttons. <laughs> Some say funny things, and others saying questionable things. Like, W what is juice? Like, uh, okay. And then you got one that says soup, but I have no clue how that's supposed to work. Um, what you just gotta do? Drown him in soup? Does there gonna be like a guy that comes in with, you know, hot soup? Okay. And then we got, you know, ha ha gas, which I, I guess they're meaning laughing gas. And then we have the one that says either cock or, you know, the F variety. At timestamp number 713, Blitz asks Moxie a personal question. If Millie pegs him, and the follow-up answer and confirmation is yes, or, uh, sometimes. <laughs> Accompanied by Moxie's cute blushing face. Mm-hmm. Up next at timestamp 737, Blitz makes a comical fourth wall jab at the musical Cats. Since it pretty much was about ugly and horny cats, we also won't talk about the movie. The what now? Exactly! At 7.53, we are getting to the super drugged up and hallucinations part. So strap in, folks. We're about to get some Blitz Moxie bombing moments. Hashtag mitts or mitso or blocks. Like Roblox. A any of you 2005 kids out there? Yeah? Uh, I I'm, old. I'm, I'm feeling old. You're feeling old, okay. At 8.09, the animation begins to shift and change from our typical hell of a boss style to a familiar Disney-like style with rubber hosing and smoother frames of animation. The colors are pastel and have a fairy dust-like appearance about the scene. But Moxie's acting out Phantom of the Opera and Blitz being the Phantom, playing the organ. He's so talented. At 9 on the dot, you can faintly see the sketch lines on Moxie as he sings, but we think that this was intentional, because Disney did similar things back in the day, and it is only on Moxie and not anything or anyone else. This happens throughout his hallucinations, so look carefully. At 9.08, a smooth transition to Blitz's hallucination, where he is dressed as a clown, and the marking on his forehead changes to a broken heart. Aww, okay. And on his cheek is a single tear. Aww. He appears similar to the 17th century Italian performing trope style of clown, known as the period. Uh, they're also known as sad clowns. Let's not forget the animation. So Blitz's hallucination style overall reflects a cuphead vibe mixed with 1930s animation and Pink Floyd's The Wall. At 9.17, we get a moxie blob. You can see, you know, the distinct horns, and it covers Blitz in a reddish goop, to which Blitz licks. Ew. Gross. Like, is it chocolate? I kind of hope it's chocolate. Yeah, but anyway, at 922, if you blink, you'll miss that Blitz is trying to push and fight against the moxie blob. But, you know, he gets pushed down in return. And yes, we are now forever calling these creatures... Moxie Blob, and the others will follow suit. Ha ha ha. At 925, we get <laughs> Doodle Moxie! We mean this in a kind and affectionate way. But also, it is important to note that as Moxie speaks, we are getting an inner look at how Blitz f views Moxie, himself, and the others around him. He sees Moxie as very prim and proper, and being above him in many ways. At 9.54, we switch back to Moxie and we get a further look into Blitz's personality. Apparently, he has a reoccurring issue where he pushes those that, you know, care about him or, you know, love him away. And Moxie recognizes this flaw. Moxie points out that Blitz has a fear of being alone. You know, and that just causes him to be toxic. 
tan 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 at 1021, Blitz tries to defend himself by saying he doesn't need Moxie or Millie or anyone, and that he can do the job alone, despite what he truly feels, which is, you know, not being alone. And at timestamps, yes, I said timestamps, 1030 enters Striker Blob with 1930's sepia film tone. Then at 1035, enter in Fizzablob with his 1920s through 1930s rubber hose animation style and then finally enter Verosica Blob or Veros Blob at time 1041. I told y'all we're calling them blobs that's what they are <laughs> but anyway Veros Blob seemed to be crying her makeup running and at 1046 the heart on her cheek is broken as well similar to how Blitzos is I keep saying Blitzos eh. <laughs> At 10.56, we see Stolis at the top of some pretty angelic-looking stairs, and the two imps fanning him look like Blitz. Huh. I really thought that, you know, we were going to see the cherubs in this scene, you know, since everything looks so heavenly on this staircase. But like before, they are, you know, not mentioned or seen, nowhere to be found. Maybe later. But notice that at... Timestamp 1105. We see that Blitz is slowly climbing his way towards Stolas. Now, it's worth pointing out, you know, a few things that tell us something rather important about Blitz. He views Stolas as a seemingly perfect being, you know, despite his kinks and his fetishes and that dirty mouth of his. Stolas is the only one not a blob and not covered in filth. He is surrounded by gold and radiating light. While things and people from Blitz's past that he would rather forget are covered in muck and slime and he is trying to leave it all behind him. However, we also see that Blitz is being chained the further he climbs up towards Stolas. When Blitz gets close enough, at 11.10, Blitz gets chained with a gold collar and leash to which Stolas holds. But also, as he is chained, he is reverting back to his regular self rather than his sad clown self. And the broken heart on his forehead mends into his normal markings. Meanwhile, we hear Moxie continuing to speak and enlighten us on how Blitz views things and his inner feelings, while also turning into a Disney princess, complete with fluffy fan. Love it. What we can chalk this up to is that Blitz is just plain afraid of getting too intimate with others. So being with Stolas seems to be a blessing and a curse. I mean, no one truly wants to be alone. I mean, not even hermits want to be alone. Like, that's why they kind of come out of the woods, like, briefly. And then you're like, oh my god, it's Bigfoot. You're like, no, that's just, you know, old man Jenkins. <laughs> but yeah, in fact, at 1148, we actually get to see some truly chilling and stunning imagery as the phrase, you're gonna die alone, Blitzo, is said <laughs> by each of the character blobs, <laughs> blobs, as well as Stolas. And, you know, they say this to Blitzo, which is like his ultimate fear, so being engulfed by these words, he's being bound by these shimmering feathers of gold, and it's just honestly terrifying. It's like shouting out into the void. Wait, did I hear scream into the void? No. No, you did not. I think I did. All right. Y you fans are gonna get it. No. No. Darn it. No. Oh, cover your ears. Angel! Uh... Now that he's out of the way, Shiro, you mentioned Blitzo's broken forehead heart, yeah? So take a look at 1148, where even in Moxie's hallucination, Blitz's marking is still a broken heart! I don't think I'll ever get over that scream. Anyway, Blitz needs a lot of healing and lovin's, which <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of fans are willing to, you know, do. But he isn't the only one with fears and needing support. Moxie does too, since at 11.55, we learn that Moxie is afraid of rejection, uh, among other things. Now at 12 minutes and 52 seconds in, wow, this really is a long episode. We still see the Blitz Moxie bonding moments. It's so beautiful. Just looking at their longing gazes. Why don't we ever gaze at each other like that? 
Uh, hun, we do. We're doing it right now. Uh, oh, hey. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah. Next, <laughs> 1302, we see that the number one button is clearly worn away. So Luna proceeds to press the number one five times. Well, the passcode was obvious. This organization sucks. <laughs> you still have it out for them. They know what they did. Or, you know, in this case, aren't doing right. Now, after our imp boys, little hallucinations, we get some backstory that, you know, wasn't in the hell of a boss pilot. The time where Moxie recalls his first mission with the company and Blitz actually complimenting him. Also, at 1406, Moxie uses Blitz's name openly for the very first time instead of, you know, the usual sir. Hmm. <gasps> I see footprints on the ceiling at 1407! Ooh, someone's gonna get in trouble! <laughs> Uh, we'll be in trouble if we don't finish part two of this video. So we still have, you know, one more part, and that's even bigger. So yeah. Bigger, you say? Mmm, I know something that's big. All right, all right. So what's next? Up next at 1421. <laughs> I was gonna make a, a a a joke about that, but. That's like a different number. Anyway, we see the exact moment where Luna starts to transform back into her hellhound form. Just look at those cute ears. Maybe you should cosplay her, Shiro. Hmm. Maybe I will. Actually, no. It's a guarantee. I will. But for our last What You Missed of this episode, at 1433, <gasps> we need a shirt with this image on it. Now. Like... This seriously is the beginning of the most bad fighting scene since the show began. Like, it goes full anime and has, like, the imp team members fighting alongside each other, and they take out so many of these, I guess, aka bad guys? Eh. It's so bloody and so gruesome, but we love it. At 1458, Luna totally balloons this agent's head clean off with his own chains. At 15 minutes, Millie's battle axe is now green due to the room's lighting, and also her horn. Also, she's such a graceful killer dancer. You know, how strong is Millie to wield that axe like it's nothing? She's so joyous. 517, tis put a flesh wound. At, uh, I think it's pronounced Mike Bogsy. Yeah, at Mike Bogsy. Uh, it's his Twitter. Go follow him because he helped do the composition and used a fisheye lens for the timestamp 1518 through 1536. It's a wondrous sequence where Blitz and Moxie fend off the enemy and use various weapons and vicious, you know, tendencies to, you know, viciously, uh, kill. In fact, at 1528, we see Blitz taking a selfie with a decapitated guy's head. The phone says Thought Patrol on it, and this very photo was uploaded to Blitz's official Instagram <coughs> Fox account. So go check it out! At 1524, Moxie's golden pentagram pistols make a return! At 1524, Blitz pulls out a sick looking dagger. Looks like an alligator. At 1529, Moxie starts getting brutal and pistol whips an unfortunate agent. At 1531, Blitz pulls out a shotgun with the words Stallion engraved on the wooden handle. At 1535, Moxie does a hissing war cry. Go, Moxie! At 1536, Blitz pulls out a crossbow. So many weapons in such a small bag. It's so deep! Mmm, right it is. At 1544, Blitz is so proud of Luna as she shoots and, you know looking like a badass like she looks like the terminator but you know furry the f1000 <laughs> <laughs> like, i i can't get that image out of my head now <laughs> at 1548 blitz gives his daughter a big old kiss on the cheek and then heads off with a bye sweetie and his backpack cheryl can, can we slow down no speed route speed route let's go <laughs> Just another quick note, there are cameras in each corner of the room, so, you know, no extra timestamps, just, you know, just look around, literally at 1614, you know, you can see it. But also, can we acknowledge that Millie is so dummy thick that she snaps this lady's neck, like, just, just amazing. At timestamp 1618 to 1623, Bliss asks a very, uh, straightforward question that honestly probably made a lot of fans fangirl and wet themselves. 
the answer to his question was, um, Shiro? <gasps> yes! Absolutely yes! Yes, yes! <sighs> Mommy, what? Mmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will mention that just like the other fighting scenes, this one is just as bad as if not more. But there are so many racked up kills that we really couldn't mention them all in this video unless you want to die before we reach the end. So just go frame by frame on your own when you can. Just know there is so much carnage, but here are some of the highlights. Rapid fire speed round, woo! So at timestamp 1638, our Duo agents break the fourth wall yet again by mentioning how the organization only uses Japanese Edo period styled weapons. Again, useless organization. But they do have a point. The Edo period was bad. And, you know, now we all know. And they died in style. Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies hit the floor. Yeah, yeah. At exactly 17 minutes, Moxie shouts out. Also, where are all these people coming from? Like, the doors are closed, and this room shouldn't be this big. Like, spatial distortion much? <laughs> Gotta go fast, you know, which is exactly what happened to this guy here. At 1708, Blitz finishes the kill that Moxie unintentionally started by blowing this guy's <laughs> off. <laughs> Ouch. 1711, Blitz pulls out my which simultaneously shouting, get it hard holding this mother as he pulls the trigger. 1740, we get to see the name of the explosive destroyer. So appropriate, the little man really did his job. <laughs> At 1740, the closing doors look like restroom doors and on the signs they have uniform male and female, including glasses. At timestamp 1743, Luna says she can't read the spell book in the flashing red lights. We see her beginning to panic, as we mentioned earlier, reading the book and opening the portals is basically one of the only things she does for the team, so it's super important. And at 1803, uh, we see a demonic shadow forming out of all the imp team's own shadows. I wonder who that could be? At 1813, we see a dark silhouette in blood red eyes that oddly look just like a certain owl demon we all know and love. Guess who? <laughs> this is the demonic version of Guess That Pokemon. It's just Guess That Demon. It's Pikachu! <laughs> I just. That, that was perfect. Oh, God. Also, at 1819, Stolas is asking who is about to do harm to his AKA impish little plaything, which he is referring to Blitz. But then it brings up the question is Blitz merely a plaything, or does Stolas genuinely love him? At 1853, we can see Stolas' Goetia symbol as having been drawn on the floor in blood, and it's some he literally summons himself. And the, like, the female agent, she spews black feathers from her mouth. It's like, Egh. And the animator for this lovely and utter horrifyingly twitching scene was at anima, what, animatron, animatrocities, I'm so sorry I'm butchering this, at animatrocities, or Rain Raptor. Go find them on Twitter, support them, thank them for the crazy bad scariness that will keep us up for days. Amazing. Uh, also, throughout the scene, Stola speaks which is the character instrumental track plays, but it's slightly distorted and very eerie, but only returns to normal when he addresses the imp team. And at 1903 onward, not only do we see Blitz staring in amazement at how powerful Stolas truly is, but we see Stolas' pure demonic form for the first time in all of its horrendously beautiful unholy glory. But I see it more as a Howl's Moving Castle reference. <laughs> 1916. Owl Daddy! That is all. 2012. The only good year. We see Luna looking a bit down and in thought, possibly because she may think she let the team down by not being able to read the book when they needed it. Maybe. Guess we'll just have to wait and see. 2026. All the fangirls in the ship us unite as it has given us life. Mmm, sharing a passionate tongue-filled kiss. The hot mirror just blew, and I'm all for it. Bring it back, Shiro. <laughs> Never! <laughs> well, finally, 
at 2051, these loser agents actually managed to capture that whole fight and stole us on camera, as well as blitz flipping them off. So like, he knew that they were being recorded and kinda did nothing, but now we have this whole ton of worms to deal with because it sounds like these guys truly mean business with HQ. And with that, the rapid fire round of this video is done. Man, I'm tired. My feet are burning! But we haven't run anywhere. Like, I mean, we are running our mouths. <laughs> yeah, but... Oh, never mind. <laughs> Ow. What the f***, guys? Oh, hang on. Uh, Crimson, let me help you. Ow! Seriously, what the flip? Why'd you tie us up like that? Well, uh, well... You guys always do these videos, and we wanted a shot. Hell, I write them, and I don't even get to do them. So you tied us up and gagged us? You know, you could have just asked, right? We would have told you yes. I told you that. Please, you brought the rope. <laughs> Not important. Look, we're sorry. Okay? Won't happen again. I mean, aside from the kidnapping, you did well. Yeah? You didn't have to kidnap us and tie us up. And was the duct tape really necessary? I mean, you want to try handling the outro? Sure. Thanks for following us through these little things you may have missed. And if you want to see more, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And ring that bell icon so you never miss a daily video or live stream. If you want to support, we've got plenty of links in the description below, including our Patreon. I hear there are some crazy things on there, including a few juicy ASMRs in the works. Mmm, -hmm. lots of juicy stuff from my mind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, wrap it up. Thanks for watching! <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye! Hello everyone, and welcome back to What You May Have Missed from Hell of a Boss, and boy is today's episode a doozy. You're telling me, this is the raunchiest episode of season one. Wait, Crimson? You're the one joining me on this episode? I mean, with all the- Let's just get into this episode and get it over with. You don't mind handling the less tasteful parts, do you? Sure thing. Let's get into What You May Have Missed from Hell of a Boss, episode seven. First thing to note is a sign that reads Imp City Second Circle. Wow, first in universe confirmation of which circle Imp City is in, at least numerically. Next is one that isn't exactly a blink and you'll miss it moment, but it's kind of funny that we see Luna drinking from a full size liquor bottle while reading Imp Gossip magazine, with Binge Drinking is Sexy Verasica Mayday exclusive on the cover. Guess she still likes the pop star for some reason. She then sets down her bottle on top of the grimoire? That is not a coaster, Luna! Even if you did happen to get the crew back into the office at the same time, it's unacceptable. But before we get to the return of said crew, we see another horse poster in the office. Man, I thought horse girls were bad. I think Blitz has them all beat. Ah, oh, we finally see our imps, and they seem to have pentagrams on their weapons, both Blitz and Millie's axes, as well as Moxie's chainsaw. Simple hellish design, or perhaps a brand logo? After hearing of Moxie and Millie's special anniversary plans, Blitz decides he needs to be a part of it and heads home to get ready. On his way out, we see two posters. One's an ad for IMP, reading Call Us with the number 666-08432190. The other is, wait, another horse poster? With more horses and blitz doodles over the frame? Blitz, buddy, you got a problem. Oh, well, everyone needs a hobby, I guess. Yeah, like us combing through episodes to find little details people may not see and probably don't care about. Let's just move on, huh? Move on? Perfect choice of words, because this is the first time we actually see how these hell dwellers move from ring to ring. I figured it'd be like a portal or something, but nope. Big old elevators! With benches and everything. 
Apparently, Hell uses a rainbow color system to distinguish each floor. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. But no indigo. However, there is a pink following the violet, so we still have all seven rings. We even get a clue as to the arrangement of the levels here. The schedule says that Pride would be above them, and at least Lust, Envy, Sloth, and Wrath are below them. So that just leaves M City to be in either Greed or Gluttony. Leaning towards Greed, but who knows? Well, I know one thing. The paper Blitz is pretending to read during his sneaking shows a picture of an exterminator. Wonder what the story is there if it's only on the back page. We also see pics of Lulu and the Fizzerali and Friends set. Is the Lulu Land story still big? Or is this just a bit of fun foreshadowing to the climax of our episode? All I know is they love digging into the torture and horror element of hell. What do you mean? Well, when Blitz tries to call Luna, the sound for his phone's place call and end call notifications, as well as the actual ringing, are all distinct screams of torment. Well, I'd be screaming too if I were going to the Lust Ring. The place seems gross. I mean, they have a place called the Tongue Lounge. I don't even want to know. If you think that's trashy, you definitely don't want to see what's by the dumpster. Oh, dear. Not a deer, but someone who knows one. It's a poster for Angel Dust, our favorite kinky spider. There's also one for the RoboFizz personal companion from episode 2, and a poster that reads, Welcome to Lust. Have an XX extraordinary stay. Okay, for once I'm actually happy to have a scene change to Stolas's place. I'd much rather watch a Hella novella with him on his Hell GTV than stay in Lust. Jim, you sure you're gonna be okay? Please. Let's just get this over with. Well, we got good news and bad news, Crimson. What's the good news? There's only one more sign to acknowledge outside in Lust. What kind of business do you think Chucklefucks is? A comedy club? But like, with sex? I don't know. Ugh. Just what's the bad news? We're going into Aussies now. No! Look, 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 here. Let me just... We rearrange some of the notes here and uh, ah, ah, there, there we go. Here, here, here's a couple pretty close together that are a bit tamer for you. I'll handle the naughty ones. Sound okay? Yeah, I think that'd be okay. Okay, let's go inside. Well, would you look at that? The butler that Stella threw in episode two is here, and apparently pretty popular. Wait. Is that Ace and Josh? Who? Ace and Josh, two of Verotica's Incubi crewmates. It is them. They seem to be doing pretty well together. They make a cute couple. And look who else is here. It's good old Wacky Wally Wackford. That's a bartender. How many jobs does this guy have? Maybe he's like Nurse Joy. There's a million of them as cousins, but they all do odd jobs around. That, or he keeps getting fired. I mean, when Lululam burned down, he couldn't sell his torches there anymore. True. And speaking of Lululand, we get to see not the robot version, but the true blue Fizzarali! Oh boy, my favorite. Apparently Blitz agrees with you, Krim. I mean, look at him hiding behind his menu. Hey, wait a minute! The Aussies on his menu switch sides! Look, you can even see it switch back a little bit later! But come on, Crimson. He seems okay here. Plus, he's got one of those wacky straws that have loops and spell a word. Oh? What does it say? It says bitch. Um, it would. Now, we get to meet our demon host, Tasmodius, the embodiment of lust. Please don't sing the song. <laughs> oh, I won't. Not here, anyway. Might hear it on one of our live streams every now and again, though. <laughs> <laughs> Ring the bell. Besides, I don't want to take the spotlight from two Broadway legends. Not only do we have Mr. Beetlejuice himself, Alex Brightman, reprising his role as Fizz, but also James Monroe Eagleheart, who was previously Vortex as Ozzy. We've got Beetlejuice 
and the genie in one scene doing a musical number together. This is poetry. Okay. I know I don't care for this episode much, but I can't help but at least crack a smile at Fizz's face when he tries to lift Ozzy back up. It's got meme material written all over it. And hey, Fizz really does his research when trying to write his material. He has a rhyming dick. You mean dictionary, right? <laughs> the cover says dick. Knowing these two, I'm sure that's not a typo. Moving on! Ozzy recognizes Stolas and apparently knows about Stella and apparently Octavia leaving him. Did this actually become public knowledge? We know Stella wouldn't have wanted it to get out if she could help it. Maybe a tabloid magazine. Or maybe, with Ozzy being the embodiment of lust, he knew about it from the beginning. And what a way to end such a show-stopping musical number! With some fireworks. Check out these phallic pyrotechnics. I'd rather not. Pyrotechnics? Ugh, stop! Okay, okay, sorry. Guess my own little fizz just came out for a second. Whoopsie! <clears throat> sorry, let's make like Stolas and Blitz and get out of here, huh? When Blitz goes to drop Stolas off, we hear the clutter of quite a bit of garbage in the van and see... Well, let's just say that we know Blitz and Stolas were being safe this whole time. It also looks like, despite everything, Blitz kept a souvenir from Lululand. A souvenir cup. And here's where we start to get into the feel zone. Solus mentions Octavia's at her mother's this weekend. Does this mean they have a joint custody? I'm surprised Stella would even go through the paperwork, but at least Stolas still gets to see Via. That'd be too much if he lost her. Speaking of Stolas and the people he holds close, have you noticed that ever since they enter Aussies, or when their first date officially started, Stolas actually drops the blitzy bit. He actually calls Blitz, well, Blitz. Oh, Blitz. It seems like a small way of him trying to show Blitz. I'm not just trying to be a silly flirty bird. Oh, Blitz. I want to show you I'm serious about us. I want you to see I care. This even makes sense with how hard he was trying at the restaurant. Red wine or white Blitz? Not with the flirty talk, but just wanting to hear about Blitz's day. Blitz! Or even here at the car when he says we could just talk. He genuinely wants to spend time with the MP loves. It's really sweet. Good night, Blitz. Makes it all the sadder when he's left alone on the steps. From there, we enter Blitz's home. First time we've seen it in the series. And there's a lot to take in here. Not only does the music completely stops when Blitz enters until pretty much the very end of the episode, but we also see a lot of framed pictures on the wall. Even Luna's adoption certificate. Of course, he'd proudly have that framed. On a slightly cuter note, did you see that Blitz actually has the doodles of Moxie and Luna from episode 3 hanging up as well? Yeah, but... Have you noticed the biggest hint that something's not right in this room? The couch being torn? No, not the couch. The framed pictures. Everyone that Blitz was in, he's been scratched out. Ones with him, Moxie, and Millie. Ones with him and Luna. Ones with all four of them. Even one with his sister, Barbie. He's scratched out of all of them with a marker. Similar to the markings on his horse poster earlier. So, he probably did it himself. You're right. Why would he do that? Well, obviously we have no way of knowing for sure, but... I think it's because he doesn't think he deserves to be happy. He talks about the importance of family, even calling his crew a family in the pilot. He adopted Luna, so of course he wants a family, but... He constantly pushes others away. Like he did with Stolas tonight. I feel it's further cemented when we see the final photo in his phone. It's him, his sister Barbie, and their mom. And he immediately breaks down. It's the only time we've seen Blitz truly break in the series so far. I know we've got season two soon, but I feel like we'll find out something happened. Something he lost, and 
while he wants it back, he feels he doesn't deserve it. Jeez, Vocal. That got heavy. Um, let's find the mood by talking about the apps on his phone. <laughs> of the ones we can see, he's got Ring Maps, Instagram, Whackdonald's, Vox Flix, Horsey Dress Up, of course, Blitz, Envy, Be Eat, Let's Finder, Sleepy Pills, Lucy Master, Money Makers Bank, shaped like Mammon, Be Artsy, of course, Blitz. There's one more that might be interesting, but sadly, his thumb covers it the entire time. Those are some crazy apps, all right. What a roller coaster to finish season one on. Oh, we're not done yet. There's one more thing people may have missed. Oh? What's that? After the credits, there's a touching memorial message to Steve Dorian. Also known as Lemony Fresh, he was an amazing animator who created animations for different YouTubers, and he was a cleanup artist for Hell the Boss. Sadly, he passed away just about two months before this episode aired. He made a lot of people smile with his work, both on and off the show. And I know he'll be missed. He will. Thank you, Steve, and everyone else who worked on this amazing season. We know you gave it everything you had, and we look forward to what the future holds. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you all again soon. We'll see you next time! And yay, we're out of lust! Catch you later. <laughs>Welcome back to another What You May Have Missed episode. We finally have a completed season of Hell of a Boss. This episode was amazing. Wouldn't you agree, Vocal? Oh, hell yeah! It was fantastic, to say the least. It feels so good that we have a full, completed season. And it was well worth the wait for many reasons. But we'll get into that soon enough. Ooh, I want to know now, so let's get into it. Right off the bat, the episode starts, and we don't have the opening credits for this one. Very curious. Mm, indeed. Maybe it's because this episode is happening at the same time as episode 7. The phone call Luna gets from Blitz when he's stalking Millie and Moxie on their anniversary is proof that both episodes take place at around the same time. Aw, oh, look at the picture of my little Looney used for my contact! I look so good! Yeah, I'd fuck me anytime. You go ahead and do that. <laughs> anyway... We finally get to the party, and we already have hounds hurting our Luna! Rude. The so not fetch line could be a reference to the movie Mean Girls. That is so not fetch. Not fetch. They should have a movie called Mean Hounds. Right? Also, hmm, I wonder if bitch is a derogatory word for the hellhound community. At least when used in a negative connotation. Massive bitch! <gasps> I mean... Clearly no one has a problem with it later with the Elzebub. How am I dirty bitches, bitch? Bitch. Yeah, bitch. We finally get to see a new overlord, Queen Beelzebub, who is voiced by Kesha. She's so cute. Viv confirmed that she is a fox bee hybrid. She looks very similar to a fennec fox. Cute, sexy, the whole damn package. Plus that song. God damn has cotton candy been stuck in my head for the past week. And, fun fact, even though Kesha plays the speaking voice of Beelzebub and co-wrote the song, she's not the singing voice. That credit goes to Rochelle Diamante. Very talented. And, am I the only one who gets a little flashbacks from Fibsy's past? Duh, young anybody? Also, just a little fun thing, am I the only one who noticed that Beelzebub's color scheme is kinda reminiscent of the pansexual flag? Pan pride! Gosh, look at her place. Very fitting. It looks like a hive. I wonder if Bee feeds off Sinner's gluttony, especially when she says, making me that honey, high on this tasty energy, and taste the flavor. Not to mention the fact that what Veronica was drinking in episode three is called Bielza juice. They're clutching onto that Bielza juice bottle like a So that means it's coming straight from her. God, if that's the stuff Blitz was on tonight, no wonder it turned that fish into a fucking kaiju. But you do have a point there. Is it possible she is getting energy off of people's gluttony? Would that mean Ozzy feeds off Sinner's lust? Not too sure. But it is a good theory. I guess we won't find out until Vivzy confirms it herself. Anyway, guess who's dating the queen of gluttony? Vortex! 
after spring broken, we finally get to see Tex's girlfriend. That's another instance where the overlords are involved with the lesser. And that's pretty freaking awesome. Wait a minute. This episode's happening at the same time as Ozzy's. That means that Cotton Candy could be being performed at the same time that Moxie is beginning to sing his song at Ozzy's. And if that's the case, then it makes total sense why Moxie would be singing More than Bielsa loves her bub. Because here we see her bub being Tex, and therefore we know Bielsa loves her bub. And Tex is voiced by the same person who voices Ozzy at the same time this is all happening. What is going on here? The pieces are falling into place, but the puzzle's not complete yet. Vivzi, what are you trying to tell us? I don't know, maybe she's not trying to say anything specific, but it's still kind of funny to think about. Um, vocal? You alright? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, take a look at the plant in the background. They look very similar to the one Stolas has in his kitchen. I wonder if it's a plant species that is found in every rite of hell. Aw, oh, isn't that nice? The imp from the Harvest Moon Festival seems to be making a full recovery. And look, it's one of those... things that we saw Stella strangling in the circus flashback. Um... What the fuck are those things? We've also come to learn that Belphegor, the head of Sloth, as referenced in the circus episode with Stellis's happy pills, is also female presenting. Can't wait to see what her design's gonna be. That's so cool! The diversity in this series keeps growing and it's wonderful. Speaking of which, we have more trans representation! We love to see it. We also love how Blitz gets immediately concerned, no matter what's been going on with him personally, when Luna calls him to come get her. If their apartment is in the same ring as their business, that means he had to traverse rings quickly to get to her that fast. He's such a good dad, and he feels so proud and happy when Luna calls him dad. Such a sweet moment between them. Aw, oh, that's my little Louie. I'm so proud of her. Yeah. Also, he's very protective of the hound who's hitting on his daughter. We've actually seen him before. In Sing Stars, we see his profile pic on Luna's Instagram account. Guess they hit it off, eh? I'm glad they hit it off, because Blitz and this imp definitely did not. The second Blitz found out Dennis's name, he was instantly repulsed. What's wrong with the guy's name Dennis? This poor guy was so upset at being turned away. Fun fact, when Vivzi first wrote this bit, Brandon Rogers called her and told her that it was a joke that he would have written. This was early into writing with him, so it was a pretty big moment for her. Fun fact, Dennis was also voiced by none other than Ed Bosco. The dude's practically Vivzi royalty at this point, wouldn't you think? Next moment, we have a bit of a backstory. Do you need to throw up? No. <laughs> yeah, you do. This interaction between Luna and Blitz actually happened to Viv and Helova art director Sam Miller after the has-been pilot screening party. Apparently, Vivzy really needed a bomb. <laughs> Finally, back home, we get to see a new angle of their apartment. We can see a couple of magnets on the fridge, one being the IMP logo and a Lululand one as well. Super cute. I want them. They're mine, bitch. Get, get your own. Up again. Oh god. Anyway, if you pay attention to the music near the end of the episode, it's the same as Ozzy's and also in Western Energy. I wonder if there's a correlation between the music and Blitz and Stolas? Also, it's worth mentioning that maybe it was a good thing this episode was put on hiatus, as we get more detail of the text conversation between the two. It does make Stolas' text hit differently. You can handle any stupid jokes clowns can make. Knowing what we know over the past several episodes, especially Blitz's remark of Fizz was right. I'm gonna die alone, aren't I? That whole night hit Blitz harder than he let on, and hopefully things get better moving forward. That's not the only thing to put into perspective here. Luna says she'll always be there for Blitz, then just a few days later she gets told Blitz might replace her? Maybe she felt he doesn't care if I'm cured, just that he's not alone. Fuck, that's heavy. Hopefully, Blitz will be able to open up in a healthier way in the future. And finally, during the end credits, we get to hear Monster's Ball by Silva Hound that was performed by Lalila and Chi Chi. 
This song is also amazing. Overall, this episode was spectacular, and I can't wait for the next one. I know you can't either, Luna. Yeah, thanks for having me, Vocal. I had so much fun. <laughs> hey, bitches! <laughs> Guess who threw up in the trash can? Really, Blitz? Who wants to sweep my whack Donald's? Daddy wants chicken nuggies. No, go to sleep. Fine. <laughs> chicken nuggies. As I was saying, I had so much fun. We hope you guys enjoyed this new episode of What You May Have Missed. With that, we finally covered the whole first season. It took a bit, but was well worth the wait. It was. Thanks for watching with us, and we look forward to seeing you all in the next video. Oh, and don't think we missed that sweet thank you at the end, Viv. Honestly, we should be thanking you and your amazing team for producing and making such an amazing show that we have come to enjoy for these past few years. Honestly, this episode was definitely worth the wait, and I know we are all excited to see what you've got planned for the rest of the show.